All right. Um, well, I, uh, thanks for, for being here. Uh, the reason I guess I'm here uh, is because of Mark Hernandez uh, suggested that I uh, uh, chair the, the working group on, uh, on the hypertension protocol. And I think that really the idea here is to, uh, to see if we can um, all, all of us be sort of using the same basic protocol as we treat hypertension. Um, and um, Evelyn was uh, on our committee and what we, what we tried to do was to come up with a protocol that um, would be uh, fairly straightforward and it would be based on the most, uh, the most recent evidence-based uh, documents. And we chose uh, JNC8, which just came out last year. To um, to base our new algorithm and and so I think some of the, the things uh, I mean all of us are, are familiar with uh, hypertension and um, and uh, the treatment of it but uh, I think that um, uh, there are some slightly different things in the new JNC eight that I think that we might want to take a look at um, so here is. Uh, we, we have sort of a, a, a basic protocol, and it's in your handout. There's hypertension screening, and then there's hypertension treatment. And I'm just going to walk through uh, uh, how we're, we're going through this. And, and, and really, this pertains basically to patients that are 18 and over, um, uh, so for the treatment of adults. And we have a little discussion about there's some uh, differences in the treatment of adolescents with hypertension. And, and, but, but this really is uh, designed to address that population. And guys, this is page four of the full protocol that you have. It's a little hard to read on the on the handout on the handout of the slides, but it's page four of the full protocol. Right. So let me just walk through the uh, the screening protocol. Um, uh, one of the things that we're trying to operationalize as a, as a community, if we can, um, and this is really stressing out the IT folks, I think, is uh, the concept that every encounter you get a blood pressure. Whether you're uh, just a, a routine visit or it's a, um, a visit to the ophthalmologist, uh, and, and really this sort of this concept came up with uh, um, I went to see my dentist the other day, and he took my blood pressure. So, uh, you know, if, if we can uh, get into that discipline that every encounter we're going to be checking a blood pressure. And where it stresses out the IT is the idea that, that wherever you hit the safety net, whether it's at this clinic or... Um, seeing um, the dentist or seeing the ophthalmologist or whatever the in encounter, we capture it and we have the ability to say, you know, the last three times you've encountered a medical facility of some sort, your blood pressure has been elevated. Because we didn't want to have a situation where we're just treating for a single elevated blood pressure. And so that was really where that all came from. Um, and uh, I don't know how, uh, is, is that just a pipe dream, uh, no. Mark, but yeah. That we and, can do that. and so to really operationalize that, the trick will be not only do we have to measure it, but then when you see that patient in the clinic, you actually have to easily be presented that data. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Emphasis on easily. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and our dream, uh, you know, our, uh, that, you know, in, in our committee was that uh, this would pop up when it hit when you hit the segment on blood pressure, you know, the last several blood pressures there they are, and uh, so that you could uh, you don't have to search for it. it's it's just right there, uh, so that you can make that diagnosis that you know I don't think it's a fluke, uh, you know it's not a random event you do have high blood pressure. So um, and what is high blood pressure? High blood pressure is 140 over 90. Uh, we have some some of the hypertension stages here. Stage one would be what we're calling high blood pressure, 140 over 90. Um, if you're under 60, if you're over 60, then this is a JNC8 definition. Uh, you're allowed a systolic of 150. So 150 
over 90. Okay, so blood pressure is elevated. Um, and then uh, the, the idea is if somebody does have an elevated blood pressure that uh, we would, uh, let's, you know, kind of settle down, let's, uh, let's check it again, um, maybe by the physician or uh, again by um, uh, the uh, med tech um, uh, or MA, you know, just at another time, just kind of let's calm down and check it again uh, at another time, thinking that it might, you know, there might have been a lot of anxiety getting there and so on uh, when, it, when it first uh, comes about. Going in parallel with our, um, uh, uh, in our algorithm of treatment is patient education about high blood pressure. Why is it an issue? Why do we, why are we concerned about it? And so on. And also part of uh, the patient education piece is uh, lifestyle issues that, that might impact it. Um, and in particular, um, um, how much salt is there in the diet and, and things like that. Um, I know we, we all have different ways of doing this and, and uh, 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 I, I tell patients, uh, you know, if you just follow two simple rules with regards to salt in your diet, one is never add table salt once food's been prepared. And the second one, and this is the hard one, don't eat things that are salty. <laughs> How do you know they're salty? They taste salty. Yeah? What are the concern with salt? I mean, the, I saw data in the 80s and again most recently that uh, populations with higher salt intake don't have higher blood pressure, maybe lower. I know it's fluctuated, but it's never <clears throat> been like conclusive except someone's heart failure or diuretics. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think that it, I think there is a pretty good connection now that uh, with high salt diet that, uh, that and, and the recommendation is uh, definitely you want to be under <clears throat> two grams a day if you have hypertension. And uh, so, so those are some of the lifestyle things, uh, weight loss, um, those kinds of things, uh, you know, can be helpful as well. Um, and uh, so let's say we're encountering for the first time, we don't have any other blood pressures. This is the first time we let them chill, calm down, go to that special place in meditation of unicorns and rainbows for a moment and still their blood pressure is elevated, then we say, okay, look, this is one time and you have high, you may have high blood pressure. This is an issue. We need to check it again at some point. So uh, what we were saying before declaring them that it would be two different encounters of, uh, of eleva elevated blood pressure. Um, once we've made the diagnosis that they probably do have high blood pressure, two different encounters, um, these are some of the things that we're going to want to get. Um, so it's not three anymore. Yeah, we we set up. We said you know three is nice, but you know, and we just we felt like that was just going to be too hard to manage. Okay. Yeah. And George, does the number matter? Like. When you say one encounter, but if it's 200 over... Yeah, right, right, yeah, right, right, exactly, yeah, yeah, right, yeah, yeah, right, yeah. 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 Border, yeah right, right, yeah. okay, yeah. Um, I'm, on, I'm uh, you know, that just, you know, those really super high ones, uh, you know, that, um, I'm watching the series called uh, The Roosevelt. Have you seen any of those? It's great, it's a Ken Burns thing. And um, I heard this lecture about uh, oh, high yes. blood pressure and the concepts oh, yes. in the 1940s of how they treated high blood pressure then. Basically, they didn't treat it then. They thought that blood pressure was elevated for a reason. It was elevated because you had stenoses in your carotids and your cerebral arteries, and you needed that pulse to, to, to be able to perfuse the brain. That was the concept then. And there was a document from the White House uh, physician who was taking care of FDR, and this was towards the end of his life, um, when uh, he, you know, that famous photograph at the Malta, the Treaty of Malta or something, where he's sitting there with Churchill and Stalin, and basically giving away Eastern Europe, um, and and uh, his blood pressure was recorded uh, around the time of that meeting, 300 over 150. But the White House physician said, you know, he, he needs it. You know, he needs it. And of course, two months later, you know, he had a stroke and died. But that was the concept back then. So, um, so yeah, he wouldn't have needed a second blood pressure. 
Yeah, just to your point. <laughs> <laughs> you would have gotten you would one. Have <laughs> 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 um, okay, so uh, so lab screening, uh, we uh, 12 lead EKG, and, and what we're looking for here is uh, LDH, left intracranial hypertrophy, uh, in that primarily. Uh, uh, a UA to look for, you know, proteinuria, fasting, uh, blood sugar, anyone say, so, you know, mostly because of that, you know, that concept of cardiometabolic syndrome. I mean, they track together oftentimes. Um, and then uh, electrolyte strand in BUN, often a, a, a calcium lipid profile and so on, uh, is just the, the basic screening. Um, uh, and uh, we're not saying that an echocardiogram is necessary unless the LDH looks like it's really severe or something on EKG. You know, that's just sort of a judgment issue, you know, from that standpoint. Can uric acid, I read also. Can uric acid, yeah. It's elevated, so yeah. it's essential. Think, yes, right, that. right, exactly. Yeah, yeah we, can, we can check that too. Uh, and... Um, the, uh, and then, you know, the H&P and, and labs ordered here. And then making the diagnosis again, we, we said we want at least two elevated blood pressures, two different encounters. Uh, okay, any, and, and, uh, and maybe we will be able to, to pull all of that together, you know, the different encounters and pull that in, together from an IT standpoint, that would be wonderful. Uh, the, uh, uh, any questions about the, the screening, yeah. Mm -hmm. So often we'll see if we review all vital signs for like several years, we'll see that, oh, maybe one out of five of the blood pressures is elevated and it's, um, how, do, how do we deal with that data? Mm -hmm. Just one out of five. One out of every five, but mm -hmm. hey, there's four in there mm -hmm. that are elevated. Yeah, well, that's a great question. You know, the, the, the thing I really struggle with, with, with hypertension, and, I, and, and every chance I get, I ask people this, is um, what about white coat hypertension? You know, the, the you know, blood pressure being elevated uh, because, you know, uh, surge of adrenaline, they're anxious, excited, and so on. And uh, what about that? And, and I think it's a real phenomenon because um, I have patients that every time they come to see me, their blood pressure is elevated. And um, I give them a, a blood pressure or recommend a blood pressure cuff. By the way, I, I always recommend the Omron, it, you know, the, and, 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 and the arm cuff rather than the wrist cuff. And I found that to be very reliable. And, and, and I say, you know, keep a diary, re record them. Um, if there's some issue with the, how well their blood pressure medicine is working, I'll have them take it twice in a day and record it. And I have patients that do that, and they keep very careful notes, very reliable. You know, engineers, you know, that, that graph it, and, you know, the, how much variability there is, and, and so on. And then they come in, they come in with their machine, and we check it, you know, uh, and we're getting a high reading, and, and we plug in their machine, and they get the same high reading, you know, within five millimeters of mercury. One third so we don't, over 80 at home? No. Yeah, sometimes, yeah, 120. No, but I mean, we're aiming for 130 at eight, over 80 it, at home what? as opposed to office. Yeah, well, uh, anything under 100, under 140 over 90 would be our Okay, so goal. you're using the same numbers yeah. at home. Yeah, and so uh, so then they, uh, and so every encounter they have with a, in a facility, they, they're, they're elevated. So I, my bias is, is that, um, White, white coat hypertension exists, and if you can get home readings or a less stressful environment, that they are valid. Um, uh, sometimes I question the machines, but you know, having them bring in the machine and checking it, right? You know, we'll do it old school. You do it on your Omron, check it. Um, but isn't it also that that a lot of the diseases that we see in doctors' offices? So even if yeah. you have normal blood pressure at home, all yeah. of our morbidity, mortality data right. looks at doctors' See, that's where data, it, so yeah. it's kind of hard to ignore it if that's what you're... Yeah, see, that's where, that, that's where I go round and round on this, is that, is that, um, is, is, is that, that idea that they probably are basing it on, you know, being done, you know, in that, that kind of setting. Now, in those studies, I, I don't think they exactly do it the way we do it. You know where they they just 
they, they're, they know they're not going to see the doctor, they're just going to see the MA, it's not a stressful thing, it becomes a routine thing, and so on like that. So I think it is a little bit different environment. But here's the problem is, is if you start treating that number you get in the office, and then, you know, you, you get this response, you know, every time I stand up, I feel like I'm going to pass out. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I am getting readings of 85 over 60, and it is, is that what I'm supposed to be doing, Doc? You know, it's just, anyway, I mean, we have to use our judgment on this, but I mean, I, that's where I struggle with it. And then when we do the EMR kind of approach, you know, where we say, well, here is the hypertension field, and only, the only thing in there is what we've put in there, you know, from, you know, here in the facility. And, uh, and so when we do our, you know, how we doing kind of thing, we don't look as well. And I don't know how to resolve that kind of issue, you know. Um, I don't know if the computer is smart enough to be able to look at the impression, you know, section and say, yes, but all the readings at home are, you know, perfect. I don't know how to resolve that. I would say that the system look at that is that we tend to underdiagnose hypertension and we tend to undertreat it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, yeah. even though those, this conversation we're having really speaks to, mm -hmm. we're being leery of overdiagnosing it and leery of overtreating it. When you look at the population as a whole, mm -hmm. we don't do it that way. Mm -hmm. We underdiagnose it, we undertreat it. We let people walk around with high blood pressure more than we should, mm -hmm. and we don't treat to the numbers mm -hmm. as often as we should. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it's not just us. I mean, there's lots of factors that play into that, but mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. overall, this is, yeah. you know. Right. Yeah, that's a very good point. So, um, all righty, so that's a screening, and I'm going to give you a switch to, if I can, am I doing this right? Or is it the, um, what's it? It may have timed out. Sometimes the overhead delay. Yeah, no, it just, it knocked out. It knocked out. Is it knocked out? To the third okay. Okay. This this looks complicated at first, but it's uh, it's uh, uh it's, it's we'll, we'll we'll walk through it. Okay. So this is the treatment algorithm, and this is based uh, primarily on uh, um, JMC eight. And now I'm going to go over some of the changes, some of the new things with JMC eight. And this is page five page on five. the protocol. And that might be more readable. I mean, I'm standing right next to this, and I'm having trouble reading this. <laughs> so it must be. So you've got it in your handouts, right? Yeah, yeah it's okay. legible here. Yeah, right. <laughs> okay. So, um, so uh, we we divide the population up into um, basically like this. Um, uh, this is uh, 60 or over, under 60, and the, and all these are uh, over 18. All this population. All ages diabetes, but no chronic kidney disease, and then all ages with diabetes, with or without chronic kidney disease. Okay, so uh, let's just go left to right. So the so the first in, in, in before we even get into the medicines, lifestyle, you know, having education for the, the patient, you know, why is this important? Why do we need to monitor it? What are the consequences of walking around with high blood pressure? What can it do in terms of you know damage to your heart, your kidneys, your brain? The, the, all those issues I think we need to discuss with the patient in education. We not, need to talk about lifestyle issues with regards to low salt diet and weight loss if appropriate and so on. And then uh, and, and then explain you know what are the goals? What are we going to try to you know treat your blood pressure to? So they're you know engaged in this process. Um, and so, so we do all of that, and then uh, with regards to um, uh, our treatment algorithm. So if they're uh, uh, over 60, we allow them a blood pressure of 150 over 90, and, and that's also our treatment goal. We want to just keep it under 150 over 90, patients that are over 60. And this is a new thing, this is from JNC8, the, the idea that uh, in their panel, they did not see an incremental benefit of treating below 150 over 90 in that age group. But it's only in the absence of diabetes. Yeah. Uh, that's right. And, uh, and so the, these patients were considering 
don't have kidney disease or diabetes. Okay. And you know, to your point, if they do have diabetes or kidney disease, we treat them to a little even, bit more aggressively. Even if they're over 60. That's, that's right, 140 over 90. Okay, um, if they're uh, under 60, the old recommendation, 140 over 90, that's how we make the diagnosis and that's our treatment goal. We wanna maintain it under that. Uh, and then all ages with diabetes but no kidney disease, 140 over uh, 90. Um, okay, so those are our, our treatment thresholds and, and, uh, and goals. Now, let's talk about medications, and, and this has changed a little bit from JNC7. We differentiate um, uh, racially in only one regard, and that is African American is um, treated a slightly different way. Okay, so non-African American, um, we, we consider four core drugs, thiazide diuretics, um, calcium channel blockers, ACE inhibitors, or ARBs. Those, those four to, to initiate. And it's, you know, kind of whatever you feel comfortable with, think is appropriate, one of those four to, to start off with. Uh, I, I tend, I mean, my practice, I usually start with uh, lisinopril. I mean, that's where I usually start, but I mean, that's, but you know, I mean, some people feel much more comfortable starting with a thiazide diuretic, perfectly fine to do that, and so on. Comorbidities, right? Yeah, so we're considering comorbidities. Exactly, yeah, yeah, exactly. So if we can, you know, kill two birds with one stone, let's do it. African Americans, thiazide diuretic or calcium channel blocker. And the, the feeling is that in African Americans, uh, they respond much better to calcium channel blockers. So that's, uh, that's the, the difference of preference or favoring of calcium channel blockers in that population. Also, like, how long do you let lifestyle management go? Well, I think it's a, you know, a, a and great. I'm sure it's like depending on how high it is. But yeah, there's right. There's a lot of people that are all just hanging out, right? Yeah, like right. They've got it. And, and right. Like, <coughs> right. Uh, you know, I think we have to uh, individualize on that. You know, uh, you know, I think it's, uh, um, you know, if if it's if it's reasonable that 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 we could achieve it with lifestyle. You know, like if we're starting off uh, in a younger person who is um, at 150 over 92 or something like that. You know, it's very conceivable. It could work. Um, and um, uh, and with um, low salt diet and weight loss, even 10 to 15 pounds can really make a tremendous change. And uh, patients that I've had that have been able to achieve that, that were on antihypertensive, I'm starting to peel it away because their blood pressure is, I mean, we're over treating them in a way. Yeah. I, I often see that there, are few people who are like the low hanging fruit and they go, oh man, doc, I've been really thinking I need to cut down drinking and, and get exercise and lose this 25 pounds I just gained. And it seems like, okay, let's try that. But it seems like most people aren't there, but when they are, it's like, okay, let's go with this. This yeah, could right, work for right, you. Yeah, exactly. And, and, and we have to individualize, you know, and we, we know the patient and we know, have a, at least an idea of how motivated they are to achieve that and so like that. So I think we have to individualize. And, yeah. Well, one thing I would offer is that we've kind of, the hypertension group, decided that if you did intervene, so if you start something, you should be reevaluating and titrating doses or changing your intervention every four to six weeks. Mm -hmm. And that's the, that's the amount of time you should wait. And then you should say, this is not working. I need to do something else. That's right. I don't know that it should be that much longer if you decide lifestyle intervention. Mm -hmm. So it's okay to start lifestyle intervention. It's just that four to six weeks, you got to bring them back in. Mm -hmm. And it may be that they didn't budge their blood pressure, but they lost seven pounds mm -hmm. and they're now walking. And you may decide to give them another trial and that's again okay that's that's completely your call mm -hmm. but the notion is is you're not just saying okay we'll go do this and we'll check on you next year right and, you know, and so if they actually stop drinking though 
It's like, wow, yeah, your blood pressure came down right. and you stopped drinking, brother. Right. Yeah, yeah. so I thoroughly agree. But you need to give them that reinforcement yeah, yeah, you have to proximate check. to what they did. Otherwise, right. you don't get the long-term effect right. of them yeah. changing their behavior. That's right. experimental science. Right, and and, uh, and like you like you said, I think that's a great point of uh, accountability. You know, we're going we're gonna to try that, but we're going to check in four to six weeks, see how we're doing. Yeah, so I think that that's an important thing. And, and that's what we also uh, recommend for uh, titration of the medications. So, um, um, so we initiate therapy. We're going to have them come back in four to six weeks. And, um, and by the way, there's some, if, we, if they're on a diuretic or an ACE inhibitor, we're going to want to check a, a BMP, uh, you know, during that, that interval, you know, between the visits and, um, and to see how we're doing there. Uh, we're going to titrate um, in four to six weeks, so we start with a, a medication, um, and it's really um, up to the clinician which way you want to go with this. Do you want to um, uh, increase the medication to uh, maximum tolerated or maximum dose, or do you want to switch to something else? And I think it depends. Uh, it depends a little bit on uh, what you started with. If you started with a thiazide diuretic, I, I don't know that you know taking HCTZ to 50 is really going to make a big difference in you know from 25 to 50 or whatever in terms of their uh, their blood pressure. So if you started with lisinopril, you started at 10, let's say, going to 20 will probably make a difference. Um, and you know, sometimes it takes uh, up to a month to see the full impact of, the, of that change that you made. So, um, um, but, you know, we have a lot of options. And, and, you know, what I tell my patients with hypertension is, okay, it's a good news, bad news thing. The bad news is we have no cure for it. We can't cure it. It's always going to be here. It's likely always to be here. Um, but the good news is we've got about a million different drugs to choose from. And combinations of them. And I... And we're almost always able to find um, a, a drug or combination of drugs that works well, that you tolerate well. So, but it's trial and error, you know, trying to find that, that out. When they come back in that four to six week uh, time frame, we're also going to, you know, did you have any problems with this uh, medication? Since I always often start with lisinopril, I always ask about the cough, you know. And uh, they, they develop a dry cough and that kind of thing. Uh, and uh, and if they do have a, that, that kind of a problem, yet the blood pressure seems to be responding, I'll, I'll often swap out with an ARP. Yeah. And when you put people on lisinopril, how often do you see like the creatinine rising at the two-week uh, test? I mean, you're looking like, am I going to unmask? You know, renal vascular hypertension. Yeah, I mean, I rarely you know, see it. Very yeah, much, I rarely see it. Yeah, yeah. not much. When you do, though, it's really dramatic. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, it's worth checking, though. Yeah. Yeah. And I was just thinking, like, the ACE inhibitors, just those inhibitors for pregnancy. Mm -hmm. Right. But mm -hmm. is there anything for our reproductive age? You know, that's, a, that's an interesting question because we didn't uh, take into consideration this protocol was written for non pregnant adults. It failed to take into account that people go ahead and choose to become pregnant, even though you may have not been pregnant when we initially started this. So I think you revealed a uh, yeah, that's a very good point. Yeah, uh, something that we will have to, uh, and I don't want to stop you, so I'm going to let you keep talking, George. But we always, I'll offer up that with all of these protocols, whether it was when Susan talked to you guys about diabetes, or now George is talking to you about hypertension, the notion is these are versions, never finals. And so, you know, we will have to figure out ways to amend these protocols as we reveal inadequacies in the way the protocol plays out. So I think we've identified one. Thank you for that. And things like verapamil or thiazide, you would sweat in pregnancy even though you might decide to change it early mm -hmm. in pregnancy. Right, right. Yeah. yeah. And I do think that we will at some point develop, much like we're going to create a gestational diabetes protocol, you know, how do we manage diabetes in and around pregnancy, which is an important thing. We'll have to do the same thing for hypertension in conjunction with our colleagues in women's health and, and yeah, I think that would be medicine and all of that. You know, to the, uh, the protocol. But yeah, in terms of this part, yeah, I mean, the, 
somewhere in here, I guess we need to ask the question, could you be pregnant? You know, as part of the as part of the hypertension <laughs> workup. So you've now revealed hypertension in an individual. Mm -hmm. You need to ask the question: Could you be pregnant? And if the answer is possibly, then you need to actually screen for that if that's an issue mm -hmm. before you start certain. Yeah, agents. right, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. 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 We're all doing that. Yeah. yeah. No, I think that's great, and that's I think that's one of the beauties of you know uh, we we're learning as we go in terms of presenting this and so on like that. I mean and you know, the majority of patients that I treat, you know, pregnancy is a, a distant memory. <laughs> and not in the future. Yeah. 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 All righty. Uh, so uh, so that, those are the core medications, and, and uh, we'll, um, uh, let, let's, uh, let's move on. And I, I want to show you some slides. Do you want to do the last column, George, the CKD or diabetes group? Oh, yes, right. Okay, so... Um, uh, these patients, um, uh, our goal is again going to be 140 over 90 uh, if they have diabetes or uh, CKD. The preference is to, you know, in the, you uh, know, to start an ACE or an R, um, and um, uh, and and th so that's the preference regardless of. Um, of race as well. So this would be the exception to the calcium channel blocker recommendation or bias. Yeah. And then if you do go to a calcium channel blocker, I know you're, you're preferring the uh, not procardia ones as, as you get later. Yeah. Right. yeah. Right. Is, it, is it accurate? Yes. Okay. So just a couple of things. These are some of the core recommendations from JNC8. I just wanted to call them out, just to you know say these these things. They may have sounded weird. Yeah, they are different. Okay. So um, uh, the first one we uh, many of these we've already talked about. So over 60 years old, the the new guideline is less than 150 over 90. Uh, under 60 years of age, same thing. That's not changed. Diabetes, now this has changed, 140 over 90. It used to be 130 over 80 was the goal, so that's changed. Do you have any caveats for that 140 over 90? But you, you know, if with more than one gram of proteinuria, we still try to get it. At 130 over 80, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. That, that's a caveat for that. Dr. Rogers, in patients over 60 that have had a prior CBA, it's still the same, less than yeah. 150 over 90. Okay. Um, Non-African Americans, including diabetics, initiate in this regard. Uh, African Americans, including diabetics, um, we uh, the, there's a bias uh, with that. Um, the, the chronic kidney disease, ACE inhibitor, ARBs, um, and if the goal is not achieved, you know, to start adding in some, you know, either increasing in the dose or adding. Um, uh, a different agent. Uh, the also the uh, the recommendations are not to combine ACE and ARB. Um, That's gone back and forth. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so that right, and so I think they they were attempting to sort of clear up, you know, that the the, the body of evidence seems to suggest that there may be more risk than benefit in combining the two. And then uh, and then and then we we also. Let's say that we've we've used our, our core medications and, uh, and and certainly it's it's fine to use beta blockers, um, alpha blockers, vasodilators, and so on like that. And we we do that all the time. And and to your point, you know we're always trying to be efficient and trying to to handle two things with one agent if we can. You know. Slow stream, trouble sleeping tonight. <laughs> So, so those are some of the, uh, the core changes. Um, and then, um, so we, we called out some of the, the strategies. So these are sort of do dosing sort of strategies. One strategy, strategy A, is you start with one drug and you titrate to a maximum dose. Uh, and then if you don't achieve your goal, then you <coughs> continue with that medication at that dose and then add a second one and start to titrate that one up. Strategy B is to start with one drug and then uh, intentionally 
add a second drug before achieving a maximal dose. And one example is, is um, uh, those, some of those combinations that we use, like an ACE, ACE inhibitor with a, a thiazide diuretic. We're not starting at the max of either one, but we thought that they might be helpful to use uh, that combination. So that's strategy B. And then strategy C is begin with uh, two drugs at the uh, same time uh, in the combination. That's the, that one. And then all along the way, you know, the education, the lifestyle, low salt diet, and so on. So those are the, the sort of the core strategies. Um, pros and cons, I, I, this, this is just personal preference. I tend not to start with a combination drug just because it's difficult, it's uh, cumbersome to titrate it. And, uh, but, but once they're kind of fixed, and if there's a combination uh, option, I might try it at that point to simplify it. Um, so, um, and then, you know, as we, uh, once we do reach the goal, we're going to want to continue to monitor them. Uh, and um, I, I would say at minimum every six months. Uh, and, uh, and then engage them in their own monitoring. You know, how are they doing? And if they really are motivated and charged up about some of those, changing some of those lifestyle issues. Um, a lot of times we will see that, uh, okay, you know, you, it took this much medication to achieve the goal, and now they really are following the low salt diet, they have stopped drinking, they, uh, they are losing weight, and now their blood pressure where we were just barely under 140 over 90, now most days they're in the 110s over 70, and some days they say that they feel like they're going to pass out when they stand up, get up out of a chair. That's when we start to peel away, you know, just um, and congratulate them for for what they've done. So um, uh, we we see that as well. So let's just uh, talk just a little bit about when to refer, or you know, th these are just guidelines. I mean, we all have uh, different threshold comfort levels with regards to this, but the the, the committee thought, it, you know. There are going to be um, times when um, when we we ought to, um, to 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 do that. So I'll start from um, from the bottom uh, because this this one comes up is uh, well. And I'll, I'll I'll start here. I'll start with resistant hypertension. So what is resistant hypertension or refractory hypertension and so on? I I think uh, you know there's a lot of different definitions. Um, the, the, the working definition that I use is that it's three non-diuretic drugs that are maxed out yeah. in three different categories. Yeah. So exclusive of the thiazide. I can't get it to work yeah, so we're yeah. maxed out on an ACE inhibitor, maxed out on a calcium channel blocker, maxed out on a beta blocker, and, or a vasodilator or whatever, and we're still not achieving our goal. And, and I usually try spironolactone before I prefer to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that, that can work well too. So, so we're maxed out, and still we're not achieving the goals, not even close. Um, so uh, I think at that point, you know, I think it's reasonable to, to do that. Now we, we said, um, you know, within 30 days, so in other words, we've, we've been going through this iterative process, you know, every four to six weeks. We're uh, we're titrating, and so now now we now we're maxed, okay, and it may not be the maximum dose that we find in Hippocrates, you know, but it might be the maximum, for example, a beta blocker. I mean, if their heart rate is 50, but it only took 200 a day of metoprolol to do that, you are maxed. Don't go to 200. <laughs> Okay, we're maxed on that one. So, so the maximum uh, dose, and your and and with and you say, okay, we're still not even close to our target, and then uh, we could, uh, and that would be a, a great time to refer, and uh, it could be to uh, cardiology or nephrology. And we had uh, uh, Peter Peter Miller, yeah, on on board, and he he said, you know, uh, let, let's that's. You know, up to the clinician. You know, it may be that you know the patient has some chronic kidney disease, and it'd be much more appropriate to go down the road of nephrology, or they may also have some 
heart failure issues or chest, chest pain issues or something like that, and, and cardiology seems more appropriate. So it's really up to the clinician. Um, and how much, but it's also different than sort of PDL, and so how much do you expect the primary to look for secondary causes if you're starting to not respond? Yeah, right. You certainly look earlier and sooner. Right. And yeah, that's right, and younger population. Right. 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 So what, uh, we, we usually go with a, uh, in, in our practice, that, that threshold of three non thiazide diuretics maxed out and we're not near our, our, our goal, is that's when we start to look, could it be renal artery stenosis? And not until then. Usually not, oh. yeah. yeah. Unless it's that, you know, super high, you know, thing, just like, wow, that's huge, and, and something like that. Um, some, sometimes in those circumstances, we'll be more aggressive about looking for secondary causes. Adult, adults that were premature and so on, we're thinking like that too, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So chest. Uh, so other referral uh, ideas. So let's say they uh, they have elevated blood pressure and they're having chest pain. We left it like this, but the intent here is it's chest pain that sounds. Cardiac. Yeah, sounds cardiac. I mean either. It's uh, you know sounds like angina, or it sounds like that ripping, tearing pain that starts anteriorly and goes to the mid scapula. That's consistent with aortic dissection. Either one. <laughs> <laughs> Emergency room. Uh, shortness of breath. It's believed to have some you know I mean that they're like in heart failure or something like that. You know that that uh, they've got this really high blood pressure. They're short of breath and they they may heart failure. Um, headaches with changes in digits. We, we struggle with a headache recommendation because you know a lot of a lot of us have you know there's headaches and there's headaches and so we said you know headaches with vision changes and the idea of you know sort of the palpledema kind of you know blood pressure out of control kind of thing uh, to the emergency room. Neurologic deficit you know somebody who you think is acutely you know, having a stroke or a TIA. And then abnormal EKG with ischemic changes with, a, uh, with an elevated blood pressure. So, um, and you know, many times in the clinic we do have the luxury of, we got their old EKG, here's the new one, and they've got some ischemic looking changes that are new and things like that. So those were the, um, we didn't put any, um, we didn't define, you know, what blood pressure would you send emergently to um, the emergency room. Um, that's really, you know, a judgment call, you know, yeah. a comfort level. Yeah. And um, so we, uh, and, and we even toyed with the idea, and I don't know, I think this was in that uh, list of ideas that were in the parking lot, was the idea of, would, you know, since this is such a, a, a prevalent issue, you know, do we um, do we create a s segmented uh, part of the emergency room just to deal with hypertensive urgencies? You know, where you know they they can potentially be you know, treated and so on like that. And I I don't know I don't know what the norm is at people's community clinic. If you have somebody who's elevated, they say they didn't take their medications, and uh, you know they. Do you do you treat them in the clinic uh, with two hundred no symptoms? Yeah. Well, uh, so do this with that uh, it's not always the same. I would say it yeah. varies, but in my in my historical thinking, at least, and a lot of this could be really old. So a one thirty diastolic to me was always a hypertensive emergency. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to look at that very long. Yeah. I'm going to punt that to the ER. Yeah. 120 is what I consider a hypertensive urgency. Mm -hmm. I've got to get that blood pressure down. If I think it's going to come down, I mm -hmm. might treat it here. I may not. Mm -hmm. I might send them 100 to 120. Quite often we would treat, mm -hmm. maybe not, especially with no symptoms, mm -hmm. but we'd try to treat them before they left the clinic. We wouldn't yeah. send them out with a prescription. Mm -hmm. We would treat them here. Yeah, right. we, may not, we may not follow them back mm -hmm. to normal because it may be a long yeah. time before they Mm. come down but at least we treat them yeah and you know that they're responding and, and well and even if you don't know to. I mean it depends on yeah. I would watch them for a while mm -hmm. yeah. depending on what the number look like but it, mm -hmm. you know there are folks that may not come down even when they're here like in a 108 say mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. uh, but but they're also completely asymptomatic, and so you have that conversation, risk benefit conversation. Right, right. Mm -hmm. Probably a lot of those people go home. Mm -hmm. I yeah. Mean, yeah. Um, there are a lot of people that you know, just like the guy this morning didn't take his medicine. He was you know 182 mm -hmm. over 100 yeah. or something. Mm -hmm. And so you know that guy will usually give his medicine mm -hmm. to him if we've got it. Mm -hmm. you yeah. Know, yeah. Just like well, you missed it this morning. Here you go. Right. But I don't. Keep him to see mm -hmm. how he's doing later. Mm -hmm. I, I think a lot of us are trying to get him down in the clinic. I mean, quantity is the new procardia, and and if we hear right away from the MAs how quick it, how high it is, I mean, we're going to be given it before we see him. But it's like, yeah, if, if they're not, I mean, if their diastolic isn't under 110, even though they didn't take their medicines. Well, isn't there point three a quantity? Yeah, it's going to be this yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was going to bring that trying to do well, yeah. You know, I, yeah. I, I think that you know the, the the protocol was they come in, you give them point two of quantity, and every hour you repeat point yeah. one, right. and then at some point you discharge them. And what we showed is we were just making ourselves feel better. Exactly. We weren't right. changing yeah. anything to do right. with the patients, right. and it in fact was not a good idea, as I recall. I haven't right. been studying in a while, but. So that's, what I that's not what yeah. I, I... So, I don't, so I, I don't necessarily think it's wrong to use quantity if you want to. I just don't tend to do it mm -hmm. because of that. Mm -hmm. And I used to I used to be one of the ones that popped a little hole. Yeah, yeah, the yeah. Program, 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 program. program. They worked like a charm. Everything looked great. Mm -hmm. and sent them home and I but I, I did say that in that. patients who haven't taken their medicines. I mean, that I did preface it. That, yeah, yeah. That. well, so... But, but I do think there are numbers to me that are absolute. Mm -hmm. Like to me, a 130 diastolic is mm -hmm. an absolute. I'm not going to send that person mm -hmm. home under mm -hmm. any circumstance. They're mm -hmm. going to the ER. Well, yeah, and, and I think it raises a good point is yeah. that you're not going to be able to, you know, I mean, you're worried about them going home, and you're not going to be able to achieve something reasonable in the clinic. And, and, right. and you know, it probably, right. it might make us feel a little bit better that we went from 130 to 118, but did we really help the patient? Or not? Right. Yeah, I think that's. You know, at least in, I don't know, in ER medicine, and that may have changed, but 130 was like the, that was it, you know, you're going to the ER at 130, and 120 is an urgency, you know, it's not, it's like, you know, but... Um. I'll have to double check, but I think we do actually have something for the clinic well, we that, have is a a, that is a protocol. That. Yeah. yeah, we have a personal so protocol. I just haven't read it in a while. So, but that's not it's what we're talking about here mm -hmm. because we don't have an absolute number. Right, and we but, didn't. But uh, in my mind, I've got an absolute number. Yeah. So, that's, so when you ask, yeah. that's yeah, and I think and I think that was really the where we yeah. we said you know it's. Um, it can be misleading with an absolute number. Right, right. Because and if it's 118 and right. not 120, and it's stroke on the way out. Yeah. yeah. I, I would offer an interesting <laughs> thought. I, w I wouldn't say this would change anybody's practice, but I've I've been taking care of a married couple uh, lately. I've got a clinic I do on Thursday mornings, and I've been taking care of this married couple. They both have hypertension. And she's worse than he is, but they're both pretty bad. And she has gotten to the point... Um, until I started seeing her, I'm doing house calls on her, so she's a captive audience. I know where they're going to be, and I catch them at their house. But she began to avoid her doctor because every time she went to the doctor, her pressure was high enough that they'd always send her to the ED. Yeah. So she knew a trip to the doctor meant a day or two in the hospital. Right. And so she decided to just not get care right. because it was better than having to go spend time in the hospital. It wasn't better for her high blood pressure, but it was better for her life. And not having to go to the hospital. Well, and I will say people have the right to refuse recommendations yeah. too. But it's really hard. If yeah. your doctor's telling you, I think yeah. you're going to die or have a stroke if you don't go to the ED, you've got to be a pretty strong little patient to be able to say, yeah, I just I hear what you're saying, doc, but I'm still going home. Yeah. And so, you know, I've been treating her at home and not sending her to the ED, even though for a while, for the first couple of weeks, her pressures were high. Yeah. And I was having the community health worker go out and check her blood pressure two or three times a week. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's it's a difficult, I mean, that's why we tried to leave this. You know, right. this group did this and they were encouraged to, uh, don't put a number on there that, that pins people in a position where you have to agree or disagree mm -hmm. with some number that the committee assigned to yeah. this referral box that says you have to do it mm -hmm. at this number. Mm -hmm. And these are symptoms that we think if you see these in your patients, you should refer them to the emergency department. Mm -hmm. But it's definitely not uh, comprehensive around all situations. Mm -hmm. right. So you still need to use your own judgment about what your practice needs to look like. Yeah. So, 
so I, I think that uh, you know the, this this protocol uh, I think you know uh, brings in uh, sort of a framework to work from that uh, I, I think is it's evidence based and it makes sense. But uh, as you can see, there's a lot of room for your you know your clinical judgment, your preferences, and so on like that with regards to exactly what you do. So we didn't want to get into the detail of you have to use exactly this medication and so on like that. And uh, so, uh, you know, hopefully it's, 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 it's enough that it gives us a framework, but not so much as to uh, be uh, too detailed and too arduous. Shortness of breath. Uh, I have a number of morbidly obese patients who are always short of breath, you know, or smokers are always short of breath. So is there some type of dyspnea that you're talking about when you say that they should be referred? Right, so, so the intent here was that this is heart failure because of this uh, undertreated uh, high blood pressure. So that was really the intent of it. So, um, so it really kind of looking for those kinds of things, you know, does the, is the, is the, the, does the patient, you know, have rowels and distended neck veins and peripheral edema, does the, does the patient uh, have a orthopnea and PND, and, you know, things like that, you know, that raise that, that concern, you know, beyond, you know, other possible etiology or COPD or something like that. And I think if you look in this, from what's been pulled out of the slide here, this table as it's pulled out of the slide, if you actually look in the protocol proper, it, it actually speaks about that. So what it says in that shortness of breath box is, Shortness of breath with clinical signs of heart failure, parentheses, jugular venous distension, pulmonary rails, or edema. And so uh, this, this presentation may have been pulled out of an earlier draft, but what you're holding is version one, and it has right. Right. the rest of that language built into this protocol. It, exactly. And so really this, this whole segment, referral to the uh, emergency room urgently, really the intent was that, that blood pressure is somehow the cause of some end organ issue, uh, either angina, heart failure, papilledema, uh, you know, uh, stroke, those kinds of things. So that that was really kind of the the intent of it. All right. Any uh, any other thoughts or? No, and yeah. With diuretics, is there now sort of a preferred? Uh, a preferred diuretic? Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I, it's, um, we didn't specify, I, I tend to use hydrocorthizine, but, so that's still yeah, what's, yeah, what's, it's probably the more, the more, uh, and, it, and then there's this list uh, that we, we had, um, you might take a look at this, these are, these are all uh, available on formulary, is that right? Yeah, so what you're looking at in this list is a list of the MAP formulary, essentially. Well, actually, there are some non-formulary drugs, but it's kind of a list of the most commonly used drugs. You'll see far to the right, there's two columns that you probably care the most about. One says MAP formulary, and they'll say yes or no. The other one says papability or papable, which isn't really a word, but you know what I meant when I said it. Um, and so basically, it describes which drugs you can use, and then under the comments, you know, it talks about you know whether there's 340B price and if there's a few comments there. Um, we are planning on keeping this these lists updated. So we did this for diabetes as well. We have this list for hypertension. As we continue to develop protocols, um, my contacts <coughs> over um, at Community Care, which is kind of the keeper of the MAP formulary for us, can generate these lists for us monthly. Uh, so as there are changes in what drugs are available, that sort of thing. We can get these, and then what we're hoping to do is either put these on a shared website somewhere so people can get access to them, or just set up some sort of regular email schedule where these things get mailed out, so emailed out so that folks understand what drugs are out there, uh, whether they're 340B priced. And you know, some of these prices are pretty amazing, the difference between 340B pricing, it's much more enhanced inside of diabetes. So if you look at that in the diabetes drug, a good example would be that a vial of um, uh, N, uh, Humulin N, for example, uh, a vial of N on 
340B pricing is somewhere between a penny and a nickel. Is, is what the 340B cost for that is. The average wholesale is about $150 and the retail is about $650. And so it makes a lot of difference uh, when you can get drugs through 340B pricing, which I don't think you guys have access to 340B pricing, but we're working on that. So I mean, one of the things we want to do community-wide is we want every FQ patient to have the ability to have access to 340B pricing. So. Because frankly, it, it all comes back to if you have a MAP patient who you're prescribing to who was eligible for 340B if they were somewhere else, but not eligible for it here, eventually those costs either get eaten by your organization or aggregated by mine. So my organization often has to pay those claims. And so I recently paid, I found out, a $650 claim on a bottle of insulin yeah. um, for a physician, an endocrinologist who wrote a prescription for a single vial of N, this is why I know these numbers, and it was filled but not under 340B price, and in fact it rolled to a retail price, and then we paid it. So I could have bought 6,500 vials of insulin, which probably would have taken care of most of the patients inside of community care for however long insulin, but I didn't get to do that, I paid for one. So we do have so. we do have 340B pricing, as you all are aware. We've had some diff we've had a lot of difficulties with when patients show up at Walgreens, them actually getting access to yeah, that. Yeah. And so mm -hmm. we we we're actually we we are getting our P and T group. <laughs> we are reconfiguring a P and T group, and I'm going to try to put together a formulary that hopefully will help with that issue and. We're actually working uh, to set something up with MedSavers so that, because um, we think working with them, since they're smaller, we can probably control things a little bit better with them. And uh, and also um, working on trying to get something through HEB as well with the hope that, that either MedSavers, HEB, may, things may work out better with Walgreens. I think with a particular formulary, things may work better with Walgreens as well. Um, so, so we are working on that. We do have access to 340B. Some of the diabetes stuff we talked about, like the Genuvia, was not particularly cheap on 340B either. Right. That was a different issue. Even the 340B pricing there was not particularly right. cheap. That was a different issue. But Mark, do you know why verapamil, like Kaline SR, isn't on the calcium channel blocker list? It's sometimes particularly useful. Don't know. I, I can certainly ask why we don't have that drug on there. What the goal would be is to create a community-wide formulary with the community-wide P&T committee that kind of, for the uninsured, underinsured, decides what drugs do we need to make available to that population, and then try to get um, community-wide pricing and discounts because we're able to bargain as a community as opposed to various individual organizations trying to get their best deals. That for so, milk can be good with some of the comorbidities. Yeah. Yeah. And that seems very, uh, it's achievable, don't you think? It is, except that a lot of the federal legislation around 340B pricing is very archaic and complicated and, you know, it's, it's that challenge that prohibits a lot of the work that we're trying to do in that space, but we're going to keep working on it because it needs to happen. And just for reference, I'll try to get a link on our intranet, but I do actually have these protocols, including the price list, are in our standards drive in a section for protocols we've adopted, and there's a folder for CCC protocols adopted by PCC, uh, but right now it's kind of hard. It's a pretty long tree to get to it. I will see if we can get a quick link on the intranet to that, and when I get updates to these price lists, I'll just put them in, put them in there so you guys can reference them on our intranet. Uh, that's my last line. Okay. Thank, you, right. George. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.